Welcome to the Inside the Sales Playbook show, where on each and every episode, we dive into the actual sales processes, plays, and strategies working for sales teams today. No high-level overview, we get into the actual weeds of what some of the fastest growing and most successful sales teams are doing today to drive revenue and grow their businesses. And we've got two sponsors. Inside the Sales Playbook is sponsored by SalesKit. SalesKit takes the guesswork out of scaling your sales knowledge all on one great platform. No longer do you have to have your sales knowledge spread out on Google Drives and on Dropbox and on various other files and folders and saved locally on your own computer. SalesKit makes it easier than ever for your team to access the sales knowledge that actually works. You can sign up for a free trial at GetSalesKit.com. And by my book, Raise Your Standards, The Definitive Guide to Building Seven-Figure Sales. You can get a copy of this book to help grow your sales, whether you're an entrepreneur a sales leader or a sales contributor at getsaleskit.com forward slash book. Let's get into the show. And I'm your host, Mark Evans. And today we've got a really great show for you. We're going to be diving in deep with an absolute revenue generating pro, Mr. Sebastian Van Heinegan. Sebastian, welcome to the show. Thank you. Thank you. I appreciate it. And good job on the pronunciation. (laughs) Thank you. I appreciate that. Well, Sebastian is the president and the revenue operations consultant at Central Metric. They're down in Austin, Texas, really fast growing firm. Now, Sebastian, are you ready to take us inside the sales playbook? Yeah, let's do it. Awesome. Well, how about you start by giving the listeners a little bit of context. What is Central Metric and how do you help them achieve their mission? Yeah, yeah. So Central Metric, we are a revenue operations consulting firm. Uh, so a lot of what we do involves building playbooks for, you know, across the revenue organization, marketing, sales, and success. Uh, and then, you know, where we really set ourselves apart is once the playbook is built and the strategy is set, we can come in and tactically support you by building technology against your playbook. Uh, you know, a, a, a well-laid plan, I think, is, is nothing without the tools uh, necessary to implement it. Uh, And that's what we do. Uh, We help business leaders get to that goal using technology, automation, documentation, uh, and and kind of just formalizing sales processes. Uh, Me personally, I mean, I kind of, you know, you probably hear this a lot. I hold many hats, you know, I'm a president and a consultant and the head of sales and the head of partnerships. I mean, uh, we're we're all over the, 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 I'm all over the board personally, um, but I'd say my main functions are growing our business internally, so increasing revenue, uh, and then servicing some of our high ticket clients as they are revenue ops consultants. Nice. So concentrating on kind of that final or that higher tier of your customers. That makes a lot of sense. Well, let's start kind of from the beginning. I mean, Sebastian, man, of all the things you could have done, of all the things you could have chosen to be as a kid growing up, man, why the heck did you choose sales and how did you get to where you are today? Yeah, I mean, um, I feel like I was always a salesperson. Uh, that's just in in my blood. You know, I was that person convincing everyone, wrangling everyone together. Um, you know, defeating objections before they were even said. You know, yeah. setting it up so that you know, removing the barriers to a no uh, or to a yes is something that I was familiar with before my career started. Uh, and so I kind of. Um, you know, it was an inflection point after I graduated from college where I had an offer from a startup to be a salesperson yep. and from a bank to be an analyst. And I thought one of these two things is a lot of fun. <laughs> and so I jumped yeah. into startup sales wow. um, and I'm a, I'm a learn by doing type of type of person. Like my first job, there was no training. It was just, here's your phone, sit next to the highest performer, do what he does. Uh, and I think now seven, eight years later, uh, I can say that I'm the high performer. Sit next to me, do what I do. <laughs> That's awesome. I really like that. So in an alternate universe, there is another Sebastian von Heinegan who is a bank analyst right now, probably not yeah. having nearly as fun as... Uh, yeah, and he lives in Charlotte. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Well, Charlotte's not a bad city, but yeah, doing the, the bank analyst work, probably not nearly as fun as the uh, the great stuff you're doing yeah. right now. A lot more overtime, but yeah. <laughs> not as fun. 
<laughs> oh, well, that's cool. Well, let's talk. So you touched a little bit about it, but um, let's talk about what makes a really good, not so much consultant, because, uh, you know, we can talk about all day kind of what makes a really good consultant, but what makes mm-hmm. um, a really good individual that can help, like in your position, help really grow revenue from the specific way that Central Metric does it? What, you know, does a really good like RevOps person, which you could, we could kind of like label you as, right? Or, or put you almost yeah. in that bucket a little bit. What makes a really good rev ops for growing companies? Yeah, I'd say for, for growing companies, you got to be scrappy just mm. 100% of the time. Like, I think that is the most important thing for rev ops for small companies because anyone can say, you have this problem. The internet says, pay uh, $100 million for this software platform to do it for you. Uh, mm-hmm. But I think for a growing company, uh, a, a real RevOps professional at that level is finding those workarounds, the integrative solutions, tying together disparate systems because you can't afford a Salesforce, like a, a platform-based solution. Uh, and so being able to see, you know, these are the resources we have, like, this is it. This is what we're going to work with. How do we make them work together uh, and uh, accelerate the the successes of our sales team. So I'd say scrappiness is really important. Uh, organization mm-hmm. uh, is another one. Uh, you know, of course, I, across every role in revenue, I think organization is one of the top top three traits. Although overlooked um, mightily. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> definitely. I'd say the one of the most overlooked. Um, so yeah, I'd say, you know, it's a combination of scrappiness, organization, and then experience. You know, I, I hate to say it as a, a young up and coming professional, but that experience is, is the most clutch, you know, being yeah. able to say, Hey, you've dealt with this problem. Well, I've seen three iterations of this problem and this is how to solve it. Uh, so I'd say those three are the, the things that make a, a revenue consultant good. Yeah, I totally agree with that. I totally agree with that. So let's move on. So one of the topics that a lot of business owners, founders, entrepreneurs, sales leaders um, are constantly talking about, they're talking about to me, they're probably talking about it to you as well, is, all right, how do we improve our onboarding and training time? Um, how do we reduce our ramp time and increase the quality of the training process? So you talked before about how your training process when you first got into sales and onboarding was, hey, sit next to the highest performer. What is your <laughs> current? What is your current onboarding and training process look like? like at Central Metric or at other companies you've maybe helped introduce these onboarding and training, um, you know, opportunities for? Yeah. I mean, I'd say Central Metric, we're a, we're a bad case and we're a really small team. Uh, okay. Anyone we onboard is already kind of on a level where we don't need to train them much, you know, they're consultants, consultant level. So there's like a little bit of training on like project management, uh, but really not too much. Um, but I think, you know, for some of my clients, I will build onboarding and training plans and yeah. um, kind of what goes into the, the, the best versions of that uh, is really a discipline and an organizational, I don't want to say acceptance. I don't think acceptance is the right word. It's like a, a word past acceptance. Uh, like excitement. There you go. Excitement. Mm, okay. Uh, so you need a little e- engagement and excitement from your yeah. team uh, because, you know, the best playbook in the hands of a team that doesn't trust it is essentially nothing. Uh, mm. So they have to trust the playbook. They have to be into it. Um, and the team has to be disciplined about getting feedback from everyone involved because, you know, the way I see it is I'm, I'm not a software developer, but I steal their lingo a lot. Uh, but when you build a playbook, your playbook is your product your sales team are your users. Uh, and so when a product doesn't work, the the developers don't say, get better, you know, figure it out and, and yeah. work with our product better. They change their product, they take feedback, they QA, and they come back with a better version. And so I think that iterative process of building based on feedback so that the entire team is all hands on deck, uh, that's really what makes it successful because adoption is the number one uh, metric to look at after a playbook is installed. Oh, I really like that. So adoption is the number one metric. And how do you go about and judge that? Like if, you know, a company hires you and you insert a playbook into their sales organization, how do you look back in six months and say, all right, we know the playbook is successful because of X, Y, or Z? Yeah. I mean, I think it depends on the organization, um, but some more general characteristics would be, you know, data cleanliness, um, conversion rate, um, the usage of certain mm. scripts or uh, templates over time and, and that performance. Um, so it, it really is kind of what are the inputs to your sales process? Uh, I'd say those are, you know, 
the the adoption to those inputs is what you measure. Awesome. Well, yeah, I, I mean, I was so looking forward to this conversation uh, because you guys build playbooks for other companies and I love playbooks and this is the Inside the Sales Playbook show. So let's dive yeah. a little bit more and get into the nitty gritty of a sales playbook. But before we do that, you know, Sebastian, I hear from a lot of either founders, entrepreneurs, or sales leaders that say, hey, we're just way too busy to put together a sales playbook. What's your answer? What's your response to someone who hits you kind of with that, let's call it an objection of, ah, we're just too busy to even even think about a sales playbook yeah well, i would say hire us first <laughs> to do it <laughs> well done, um, yeah. but yeah <laughs> i would say i mean if you are well what 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 title is saying this right you know if the ceo is saying i'm too busy to build a playbook i'm like okay that's fair you're the ceo you should be building your business yeah uh, but if the vp of sales is too busy to build a playbook i might say well, what are you too busy with? Are you doing all the demos yourself? Are you following up yourself? Then you're not really a VP of sales, are you? You're just a closer. Uh, and if you want to build a team, you need to have documented processes that lead to success. You know, you can't just have a bunch of people running around doing their best and, and hoping that revenue comes in. Uh, so, I, so I'd ask, like, do you want repeatable revenue? Uh, mm -hmm. And the answer is always going to be yes. And so you're going to need to set up the path to revenue for your team. Uh, and if you don't do that, then, you know, good luck at your next investor meeting. <laughs> yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I like that. All right. So that's the response to them. Cool. So what are some elements that you feel like every sales playbook needs to have? Like if you, Hey, you could only put five parts into the sales playbook. What are some of those elements that a good sales playbook has to have Sebastian in your mind? Yeah. I mean, again, it really depends on you know, what you're walking into, who is this playbook sure. for new hires versus people that have been there for a while? Is it a change in process versus a new process? Um, but I'd say like a good playbook breaks down your company and your industry. So you understand what problem your product is, is uh, solving. Um, it then breaks down your sales process and methodology. So how are you selling? What steps are you taking to sell? What systems are you recording that data in? Yeah, I like um, that. And then, I mean, I'd say like, that's really the focal point of it. Yeah. You know, when I build a, an outline for a playbook, it's just like industry, company, process, and then everything kind of cascades down from there. Is there a favorite part of the sales playbooks that you guys create at Central Metric? Is there a specific play or a specific aspect of the sales playbook that you're like, oh, this is what like just separates us or this is what when companies get, they absolutely love? I mean, I'd say because we're technical, the answer to that is probably our SOPs uh, or a standard operating procedure, you know, documentation on, hey, you just got a deal. That's really nice, but you have to go to Salesforce and click this button and this button and yeah. put in the data correctly um, in order to get your commission. Uh, I'd say that and the actual kind of equation of um, uh, as an SDR, if you want to hit quota, which is X dollars, then you need, you know, Y number of opportunities and Z amount of activity to get to that. So I'd say, you know, Going back to the discussion on the path to revenue, I'd say building that path based on historical data, of course, you know, none of this is yeah. a guess, none of this is a, I hope this works that way, but based on how your sales team has performed in the past and the tools that you have today, uh, what can you reasonably expect to pull in based on a pre-set amount of activity and outreach? Yeah, that makes a lot of sense. I really like that. So kind of having that like funnel math almost of, hey, here's, yes. this is your end result that you want. What do we have to start with some of those other uh, interesting or most important um, components? Of yeah. It? yeah, and, and I'm missing one. I'm missing one that, that right, actually is really popular, uh, which is the building the actual funnel uh, and mapping it out. So, you know, from inquiry to closed one, uh, who are the internal stakeholders at every stage? What systems are being acted upon on, on each stage? And so it's almost like, I think a lot of the folks that are listening to this have probably seen a flow chart where mm -hmm. it's a lead that starts here and it branches out and then that branches out and then that branches out. So having the ability to kind of sit down with somebody and say, how does a lead get from never heard of your company to paying your company money? I'd say that is is one that, you know, we 
is really popular for us and yeah. also makes the, the biggest difference, especially for those small companies. I think so, because a lot of small companies and a lot of small teams, they've never put that thought into it. And so they're they're constantly wondering, well, like, why can't I develop this, you know, consistent revenue? Or why are we, you know, just up and down like a yo-yo all the time? Well, I think it's yeah. oftentimes because they haven't thought through, well, what are all the steps in this buyer's journey almost, yes. in which we're interacting with someone in which they're learning more about us and they're not controlling that narrative. So yeah, I think that's a great, I really, really like them. Um, let's talk a little bit about how have your sales playbooks, if they have, or your customers' sales playbooks, have they changed at all? Have you had to make any edits of them since uh, the pandemic and since COVID-19 has kind of changed business for a lot of sales teams? Um, that's a good question. I'd say not much. Man, yeah, not much because a lot of what we do is already digital. It's administrating tools that are accessed via software. Um, and you doing that on your laptop, whether it's in your house or in the office, right? Mm -hmm. And so it, it's not a huge change in terms of here's how to use your instance of outreach. You yeah. Know? Um, I think it's a little bit of a change in terms of, I think the industry, even before COVID, was moving away from a smile and dial, you know, high volume cold call approach to mm -hmm. more of a relationship based community building social media focused sales model. Uh, and so we've had to update our playbooks for that um, because mm -hmm. the, hey, let's just buy a lead list and spam them with content um, from our sales team. That methodology isn't working as well in this kind of era of a more informed buyer. And so yeah. what we've had to start building into playbooks is here's how you manage your LinkedIn for, you know, building community around your, mm -hmm. your VP or your CEO's persona. Uh, here's how to engage with potential customers in a way that's not salesy, you know, yeah. because when we say relationship based, we mean that. Like mm -hmm. you have to be friends with these people or they're not mm -hmm. going to buy from you. It's not a matter of like, oh, here's a little carrot and bam, I got the sale. No, it is a long haul of like, how are your kids? You know, <laughs> um, go Titans, you know, the, the game's postponed this weekend. What are you going to do? Yeah. Uh, and so that when that need arises, you're already top of mind and you're already trusted. Uh, so that's really the change that we've made. And I don't think it's too related to COVID, but the two changes of or the two events have kind of coincided for us. Yeah. And I think it's a great change. One that has been in the making for a long time. And I yeah. think, yeah, like, like you mentioned, right, COVID just kind of accelerated that almost. But I think we were onto that path, which I think is a very good path as well. Yeah. So, Sebastian, any if there's a CEO or an entrepreneur or a sales leader that's listening to this, watching this, um, it's October 1st that we're recording this, right? We've got 90 days. Happy Q4. Yeah, happy Q4 <laughs> here, right? We got one uh, quarter. What advice would you have to the sales leader or founder or CEO who needs to have a really good Q4 here? Um, what advice would you give them to really increase their revenues and maybe help, you know, potentially save their business or, or get them set up for 2021? Yeah, I mean, my instinct is to say, start looking at Q1. You know, if you haven't prepared for Q4 already, then you're, you're, start raising that red flag immediately um, because, you know, the planning should have happened last month uh, at the latest. Um, but I would say just, for this quarter, identify your quick wins. Mm. Uh, I think sales leaders get really caught up in, in monumental, massive, you know, almost glacial changes within their organization of like, we're installing a whole new methodology. We're ripping out our CRM mm. and replacing it with a new one. You know, don't do that, yeah. <laughs> especially in Q4. Uh, mm -hmm. Look for the, the little wins, you know, how can you save your AEs five minutes per day in data entry? Uh, how can you provide that extra layer of coaching for your SDR so that they increase their conversion rates? Like look for the tiny incremental victories that can build up to a huge, massive Q1 and at least hold you above water for Q4. Yeah. So, so it's not like, hey, here's this magic bullet, right? This silver bullet that one could fire away and all the, automatically you're going to have a great Q4. It sounds like you're, you're throwing a lot of lead bullets at it, right? And there's all these little things that you can do to, to necessarily build up to a great Q1 or Q2 even. Yeah. I like that long-term approach. I think so many yeah. people though, they look for that silver bullet. Like what's that one marketing hack that I can do in 2020 to you know, automatically yeah. increase revenue? <laughs> no, there's not. Yeah, absolutely. There's not. Well, I think that's a great way for us to transition to close with our final 
five. So Sebastian, on this final five, it's five quick fire questions. I ask him, you answer. Are you ready? All right, let's do it. Awesome. First, uh, let's first let's start off with what is your favorite sales related movie? Oh, uh, uh, boiler room. <laughs> Classic. Good option. Uh, favorite sales. Oh no, Glenn of- Gary, Glenn, Glenn Ross. Glenn oh, Gary, Glenn Ross. Uh, all right, we'll go with that. <laughs> Both good options there. Favorite sales book. Favorite sales book. Uh, it's a split between Radical Candor. Is it Radical Candor? Is that the name of it? Yeah, and there was a Fanatical Prospecting by Jeb Blunt. Yeah, that's a great one. Um, what do you know now that you wish you would have known when you first got into sales? Oh, God, so much, Mark. <laughs> <laughs> so much. So, so much. On the second, um, third, and fourth installment of the Inside the Sales Playbook, the yeah, yeah. comes back. Yeah. Um, I guess the, the number one thing is that... I don't know. I don't know. Take, take, uh, I would say Give professionalism, professionalism is overvalued. Professionalism is overvalued. I wish I would have known that. Okay. All right. Your favorite purchase of 2020 that's been under $100. Favorite purchase of 2020 that's been under $100. I bought a $70 quiet punch that you can, uh, hook up to your door frame and it's just like a little bounce back and it just <laughs> in between calls it's great to get the energy out <laughs> nice that's awesome uh and the last one here favorite social media follow favorite social media follow um just across any like yeah, not sure. just sales yeah not just sales yeah anything okay i really like this writer at the root called michael harriet uh, he's hilarious. And Michael also Harriet at the room. Really smart. Uh, he talks about like race relations, politics, stuff like that. He's one of my favorite Twitter followers. Awesome. Well, we'll link it all into the comments. Sebastian, where can our listeners connect with you if they want to so do so? Yeah, I'd say LinkedIn is the best way. Uh, okay. I'm on LinkedIn almost all day. Um, It's a social media for people like me. (laughs) I love it. I'll make sure we link that in the comments below. Well, Sebastian, thanks so much for coming on the Inside the Sales Playbook show. That's Sebastian with Central Metric. Thanks, Sebastian. Thank you.